I want to welcome everybody to uh, today's, this afternoon's Zoom briefing with the Institute for Policy Innovation. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation, and I know that we probably have a few new folks who are not familiar with us. So uh, we are a free market, conservative, public policy think tank based in Dallas, Texas, where it's about 100 degrees today. But on the other hand, I think up in D.C., it's been just about as bad. So Plus, you have plus in DC they have the added humidity, which we don't have here. I want to welcome everybody for joining us today for our Zoom briefing with our friend Tevi Troy on the topic of presidential debate stories. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here. I want to especially thank all of those of you out there who are supporters of IPI. You make it possible for us to do things like this, and we very much appreciate it. Um, if after today's discussion, you decide that you should be a supporter, uh, we would invite you to contact uh, our Director of Development and Events, Addie Crimmins, who Tavi Troy knows, um, at IPI, and she'll be delighted to chat with you about how you can become a partner with us and be, join our Giving Society, make it possible for us to do events like this. Uh, we very much appreciate our supporters. Uh, we cannot do what we do without our supporters. We don't sell anything. We're entirely dependent on the voluntary contributions of people who agree or who largely agree with, with the work that we do. This event will also be recorded and archived on our website at IPI.org and also at our YouTube channel. So if you want to refer other friends and colleagues to view this content uh, after we're finished, you'll be able to do that. And uh, by the way, we were we were early on the internet thing, so we have one of those great short URLs. It's just ipi.org, so it's easy to remember and easy to find. So the first debate, the first presidential debate of the 2024 general election is upon us tonight. The earliest such debate, by a mile, the earliest such debate that we've ever had in American political history. Um, I don't know, maybe the Lincoln-Douglas debates are an exception to that. I don't know. Tevi, you can you can tell us about that maybe later. Uh, but we're having an unusually early debate, although it doesn't seem inappropriate because uh, even though neither party has officially nominated or chosen a nominee, everybody pretty much seems to be locked in and dug in, so why not? In fact, there's even been some conspiratorial thinking uh, that the purpose of having a debate this early is to see if either candidate uh, proves themselves to be inefficient tonight, there's still time for the various parties to maybe go in a different direction. Uh, I'm not much of a conspiracy theory person, but this time, maybe maybe it's possible, given the fact that both candidates have largely negative uh, ratings among the American people and even among their own parties. Uh, we thought a great way to get prepared for tonight's debate would be by having our friend Tevi Troy jo join us. Uh, Tevi is a historian of the presidency in the White House. And Tevi has also not only been sort of an egghead academic, but he has also worked in White Houses. He's worked in administrations. And so he has the perspective, he has the outside in perspective, but he also has the inside out perspective, which I think makes uh, Tevi's perspective uh, extra valuable to us. Uh, not just this evening, but in general. So, Tevi, thank you so much for joining us and for making time for us this afternoon. Thanks. I'm always happy to make time for IPI. I'm a big fan. I love the work that you guys do. Tom is great. Addie is great. Merrill is great. Really a terrific organization. And so I'm thrilled to do stuff for you and with you guys. And I thank you for all that you do to advance free markets in this great country. You're very kind. Thank you so much. Uh, Tevi's last book was called Fight House, Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump. And we actually did a Zoom briefing on that book. And we also had Tevi do a little bit of chatting about that in person here in Dallas. So if you go back and look at our YouTube channel, you can actually find that briefing as well about Fight House. And you can go online and you can buy that book. But Tevi, it's my understanding that you have a new book coming out soon. Tell us about that. I sure do. And it will be of great interest to IPI fans and IPI itself. It's called The Power and the Money, Epic Clashes Between Commanders in Chief and Titans of Industry. It's about CEOs and presidents of the United States, their various fights, the ways they got along, the ways they didn't get along. And all throughout, it's a story of how government has gotten bigger and bigger and encroached more and more on big business to the point where right now, if you're a CEO, you have to take government into account because government is driving everything you do, whether it's how you make your product, who you employ, 
whether you can trade your product abroad, what kind of environmental rules you have to live with. So everything is dependent on government. If government wants to put the squeeze on you like they have been doing to Elon Musk recently, it can really affect your business. At the same time, if government wants to get, grant its largesse to you, it can also make your company. So CEOs increasingly have to take government into account. And this book is the story of how that happened, going back to John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan and going all the way up to the president with Gates and Zuckerberg and Musk. It's a really it's a terrific book. I'm very happy with it. And it's coming out on August 20th. Great. Is that available for pre-order yet? It is available for pre-order, and I expect to see a nice bump in the uh, pre-order sales as a result of this conversation. But yeah, you get you can order on Amazon already. We will uh, we'll buy more than one copy, and we'll give them out to friends and that sort of a thing. So I'm really looking forward to that. You know, just as an aside, um, you know, I've been at this long enough to remember back, sort of in the early days of the uh, internet revolution and the tech revolution that a lot of tech companies had this idea that we don't need to establish DC offices. We don't need to bother with Washington. Uh, we'll leave you alone if you'll leave us alone. Just let us sit out here and innovate and we're not gonna get involved in all of that. And many of those companies learned a very painful lesson, which is that, that government is coming for you. Uh, <laughs> whether whether you are, care about government or not, government's coming for you. So true. And in fact, in the book, I talk about this explicitly and how Bill Gates thought he was going to be like John D. Rockefeller and create this empire without government noticing. And yep. government did notice. And uh, the Clinton administration came after him hard and uh, it it broke up his company or it, it curtailed his company. Um, and also I mean, he left immediately after the Clinton administration's uh, in, in attacks on his company, and they never made it explicit. But it seems to me, based on my research, that that was what led him into the world of philanthropy rather than ru running the company. And Brad Smith, who's now the uh, general counsel there, he got a job at Microsoft by initially saying, make peace. Really, we've got to appease government. Uh, Bill Gates had a very contentious approach to dealing with government. And Brad Smith came in and said, no, let, let's, um, you know, let, let's give them what they want. And, that, and that's the way to, to tame the beast. And then later, I have in the book, that Bill Gates goes to a young Mark Zuckerberg. He's still young in my book, but uh, he goes to a very young Mark Zuckerberg. And he says to him, get an office in Washington now, meaning learn the lesson that I didn't learn, that I didn't understand, and really um, get make sure that you have a robust DC operation. As we all know, Facebook has one of the most robust operations in DC. Yeah, my recollection is that before the government went after Microsoft, they had like one person in DC, right? It did, and, that's true. You know, Within about three years, they had about 100 people <laughs> in right. D.C. because they found out. And I can remember, um, friend is too strong of a word, but my acquaintance, T.J. Rogers, was Cypress Semiconductor, who was of a very libertarian bent, you know, was really at the forefront of urging his fellow Silicon Valley companies to just, you know, ignore Washington, don't have anything to do with Washington. And I can remember at the time thinking that's a pretty naive approach, and and that's how it's turned out. I mean, this is the downside of big government, right? Is that you can't, yeah, you can't discount the effect of government on your business. Right. The only thing I disagree is you said the disadvantage of big government. There's a lot of yeah, disadvantages okay. of big government. <laughs> okay. so yeah. One of the many disadvantages of, right, of big government. Right. But yeah, I agree with the basic point. Uh, but also, I show in my book, and it's a recurring theme, uh, John D. Rockefeller thought he could ignore all the bad press he was getting and the negative political attention, and it ended up with the, the breakup of his company. Um, Lou Wasserman, who's a Hollywood mogul, thought he didn't have to deal with Washington, and he ignored all these uh, invitations to have him go to fundraisers and stuff like that. He didn't want anything to do with it. And then Robert F. Kennedy's Justice Department under the JFK administration starts coming after him. And suddenly he starts cozying up to president, becomes best friends with Lyndon Johnson, um, is close with Reagan, uh, very close to a young Bill Clinton when Clinton's even our, uh, governor of Arkansas before he's even president. So uh, these guys learned their lesson, but they got spanked first. Yeah. And, you know, I, I should say for the record, as a as a as an organization that believes in limited government in an ideal situation, private business should be able to ignore <laughs> the Good federal enough. government in Washington. But it, it just ain't that way. I mean, I, I know that I know that when people get upset about lobbyists and they blame lobbyists, I always try to divert that conversation and say, don't be mad at lobbyists, be mad at the government. Because, yeah. you know, if, if you want to get rid of lobbyists, just quit taxing and regulating businesses and the lobbyists will go away. You know, yeah. uh, otherwise, okay. businesses have to find a way to find yeah. representation in the system. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this because in the book, I have an appendix that you will love. It's a graphical depiction of how government has increasingly encroached on the territory that business used to operate in, in what, what I call the white space, and how government gets more and more 
overweening and more and more involved. And the the um, it's kind of a tabula rasa when John D. Rockefeller was building his monopoly in the 1870s. And by the 19, uh, 1990s and the 2000s, it's this crazy quilt of regulations. And it's very constraining in terms of the room that businesses have to operate. That does not mean they can't make profits. I'm not saying it's not a uh, capitalist society anymore. But it means that you have to take government's interests into account. And if you partner with government, you will probably do better than if you ignore government. There have even been, in in my experience, there have even been situations where where I observed a committee chairman deciding to hold hearings on a particular issue. And it's like, there's no pressing policy problem here. Uh, There's no controversy here. Why have you decided to start holding hearings on this issue? And I swear it's almost as, as if they do it to pull business in, essentially to say, um, you're possibly under threat. You better get involved and you better start making campaign contributions. You know, I mean, nice the, business the, you the, got here it would be a shame if something happened to it. Yeah. The incentives are, are completely perverse. They're, they're completely perverse. It's like, you know, uh, if I want to extract money from the entertainment industry or if I want to extract money from the telecom or communications industry, all I have to really do is just schedule a series of hearings. And all of a sudden they have to be engaged and they have to start holding fundraisers and they have to start doing all this stuff. So these are these are some of the perverse um, incentives that big government gives us. And I know this is not our topic for today, but I want to mention one more, which is this is the problem with a an administration that reserves to itself the right to levy tariffs on particular industries and to grant exceptions to particular companies as they see fit, because we saw this happen in the Trump administration where suddenly there was this parade of CEOs to Washington to essentially explain why they should be exempted from a particular tariff or whatever. Uh, And, you know, again, this is one of the, this is one of the problems with having policies that are not sort of a level playing field for everyone. Once you introduce that sort of arbitrary factor, it's it's just kind of like you have you have to come pleading to Washington for relief. And yeah, that's going to involve some kind of a trade off, a campaign contributions right. or political endorsements or something. Right. And economic inefficiency and people making right. decisions not based on what's in the interest of their company, but in the interest of appeasing the government. Um, I, I just want to make it clear to all the listeners, this is not what Tom and I want to see. But right. given the realities, we recognize that these companies have to take government into account more and more as a result of what government is doing. And so in an ideal world, I'd like to see the, the, these companies able to close up their Washington offices and not have to employ teams of lobbyists. But given the realities, this is what they have to do. Yeah. If you, Again, if you want to do away with lobbying, shrink government, uh, stop taxing and regulating companies, Um you know, my defense of lobbying has always been that General Motors doesn't get to cast a single vote, you know, but yet they are taxed and regulated sort of out the wazoo, as we might say down here in Texas. And so, of course, they're going to have to find some way to be represented in the political process. So it's, it's just it's it's a natural consequence of big government, high taxes and onerous regulations. OK, well, yeah, that was I mean, fine. I guess just one more story that's so. Applicable yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, here, which is in the book, I tell the story of Lee Iacocca. Now, Lee Iacocca was uh, chairman of Chrysler and a, a very um, uh, a celebrity CEO, one of the big celebrity CEOs of the late 20th century, and um, had a uh, had a best-selling book. His book was the number one bestseller in 1984 and 1985. Uh, he was so big he even appeared on Miami Vice, the uh, the TV show in the 80s. But Lee Iacocca starts out as an anti-government free market guy who lobbies the Nixon administration to prevent the Ralph Naderite types of regulations from being imposed on the companies. But in the 70s. Chrysler's in trouble. He needs government assistance. And he increasingly becomes a big government guy. And he uh, allies with the Carter administration to get a bailout. But he runs uh, a foul of the Nick, the Reagan administration. He kind of butts heads with Reagan because he wants more and more government intervention to help his company. So here's a guy who was a free market Republican in the late 60s and 70s. And by the 80s, he's increasingly more a big government interventionist Democrat because he sees government can help his company. Yeah. And, you know, by contrast, and I don't I don't mean to um, catch you off guard, but by contrast, I, my recollection is that Bill Niskanen, who was a longtime Cato Institute uh, scholar and vice president, my recollection is that Bill Niskanen worked for one of the car companies. And that's what actually led to him leaving the automotive industry was that he couldn't he couldn't um, 
synchronize his principles with like the demand for government bailouts and things like that. Yeah, because increasingly that's what their their Washington yeah. offices are asking for. Yeah. All right. Well, that was fun, and I hope everybody enjoyed that, and I hope everybody will rush out and buy your book because I power in the money. Will. <laughs> we'll we'll Favorite do another title. book event once your book comes out we'll do another event on that that'd book because that'll be great uh but we want to talk about debates and as you said that's your jam um you're a scholar of these things and um you've got some great stories and you've got some great illustrations of how debates have uh, have influenced or have not influenced elections in the past and so i want to just sort of start off i want to start off with a couple questions and then just let you run if that's okay um, one of the things that I think a lot of Americans are not aware of, you know, we all suffer from this tyranny of the status quo. We assume that the way things are today is the way things have always been. And a great example of that is the fact that we really didn't have presidential primaries until like the 70s. You know, I mean, people think today that's the only way for a party to choose a candidate. But we have not always had primaries. We've had other ways of choosing candidates. And my understanding is it's the same thing with presidential debates, right? We've not always had presidential debates. That's a relatively recent um, innovation in uh, pl American political history, right? Yeah, it's so true. And it's also interesting in that if you ask somebody who's relatively knowledgeable about American politics, they will know one thing, which is 1960 was the first presidential debate. Nixon goes against Kennedy. Kennedy does well on TV. Nixon, if it had just been on radio, probably wins that debate. But on TV, Kennedy is uh, tanned and good looking and, and looks better than the sweaty, jowly, five o'clock shadowed Nixon. So that's kind of what everybody knows who's somewhat in interested. But very few people know that even after that, the debates went away again. And there's no debates between 1960 and 1976. Wow. And there's a whole story about why those debates didn't happen. And Richard Nixon is in the middle of all of it, because in 64, he's not on the ballot. Barry Goldwater is. Uh, Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, has this huge lead over Goldwater. He sees no reason to debate. He writes. Um, and so he's kind of ducking the debate. Nixon writes a piece in the Saturday Evening Post demanding that Johnson debate, saying, of course, you should debate. Why aren't you debating? And so Johnson ignores it. But it's interesting that Nixon is on record saying we, you know, we should have these debates. But then in 68, Nixon's the candidate uh, for the GOP. He's running against Hubert Humphrey. It looks like he's going to win. He's, he seems to have an edge going in, uh, a big edge going in. Uh, it ended up being a much closer race. He did win, but a, a very tight race. Um, and he claims he's for the debates, but he's actually ducking the debates. And Humphrey's pushing him to debate, and he's not doing it. And then in 72, Nixon is in the Johnson 64 position. He is president, incumbent president, sitting there in the White House with a big, big lead over McGovern. And he doesn't want to debate at all. He sees no reason for it. And he puts out this cockamamie theory. He says, well, when the president speaks, he's making policy. And I don't think the president should make policy in real time. He makes kind of an institutional argument why he shouldn't debate. So Nixon's right in the middle of no debate 64, 68, 72. And then in 76, he got a really close race between Carter and Ford. And it's only because neither candidate knows they have a lock on winning the race that both are willing to debate. And they have that debate and the debate actually doesn't turn, turn out so well for Ford because Ford makes that mistake where he says there's no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. What he was trying to say is that in the hearts and minds of the Poles, they don't feel dominated by the Soviets. They feel like they're still free and the Soviets you know, can't control people's minds. But what he actually said was there's no Soviet domination when we all knew that the evil empire was dominating Eastern Europe. Another interesting thing about this is that Nick um, Ford was prepped on this question and was told to make an argument like this. It was, it was basically an argument for the free hearts and minds of the Eastern Euro of the Eastern Europeans who were dominated by the communists. So his own NSC staff was telling him to make this argument, um, and it was obviously a disaster. So sometimes you get bad advice in debate prep as well as good advice, as well as good advice. So, so there is a historical precedent for this idea of a president who feels confident in his lead refusing to debate. That's that's really interesting because now you know I think we see that as kind of lame, but. Uh, for, you know, from what you just said, it's like any, any president who's ever felt it was an advantage to their advantage to not debate has chosen to do that. I think if Biden had a big lead, there was no way he would debate Trump. And you know what he would say? He'd say, well, Trump didn't debate in the primaries. Why should I debate? You know, Trump, yeah. Trump doesn't believe in debates. I'm not going to. And Trump didn't debate uh, because he had a big lead. Right. <laughs> so no advantage in doing it. So it's important to say the, debates are not in the Constitution. 
there's no legislation that says we have to have debates. You know, I think they're important and I would like to see them continue. And I want them to be part of our system, regardless of whether the which candidate has a big lead or not or has no lead. But they are one institution that we need to tend and maintain and make sure that they continue because it's the best way to get information about the candidates. I mean, you know, Joe Biden's basement campaign, you don't know what's going on with him, certainly not in 2020. Uh, he's, uh, you know, protected by all kinds of advisors. Even when he walks, he's got this kind of phalanx of aides around him. So people can't see him stumble, can't see the kind of uh, black sneakers he wears now instead of shoes. Um, and it's not like Trump is out there in front of every news outlet. I mean, he does do his uh, rallies and feeds off the crowd there, but that's not like going up against a, a tough interview against, I don't know, Stephanopoulos or, or Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper is going to do the debate tonight. So, uh, so yeah, I think debates are important. I'd like to see them continue, but it's important to remember that in that period from 60 to 76, we were not having debates. Yeah, I think that I think that's really important for people to understand that. And of course, you know, I'd like us to Going back to the primaries thing, I'd like us to go back to not having primaries, but of course that's not relevant to what we're talking about here. No, but but it's okay. important because right now we have these two candidates, Trump and Biden, who 70% of the American people don't want that to be the matchup. And the primary has led to this situation. Yeah. Now, I understand that the uh, smoke-filled room is anti-small D democratic, but you know, I don't think we ever had a, uh, a matchup where the American people were so opposed to just the candidates themselves as we have now. So, uh, you know, maybe there's something to be said for the smoke filter. Oh, I, I certainly think so. Hey, I want to go back a little bit in time. You mentioned the common received wisdom. And for a lot of us, for many of us, at least on this call, this was before our time, or at least before our adult consciousness. But the common wisdom is what you stated, that Nixon lost because of his appearance, so if you watched on TV, you thought Kennedy did a better job. If you listened on the radio, apparently you thought Nixon did a better job. Is that anecdote true? Is it actually true? It's um, it, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, when, when the fact gets in the way of the legend, print the legend. So <laughs> it's, it's not 100 percent clear. Um, and some polls show that um, you know, uh, that it wasn't just um, Nixon's appearance, but uh, but it certainly contributed in Kennedy himself. Saw some footage of him from the campaign on, on a TV screen. And he said to one of his aides, we wouldn't have had a prayer without that gadget. Kennedy recognized that he had a special magic on TV. He was very handsome. He, uh, you know, the, the week before the debate, he went down to uh, Hyannisport and he got tanned. He looked good. Nixon was trying to fulfill this ridiculous commitment to appear in all 50 states, even ones that he didn't really need to appear in. Um, he had hurt his leg um, and he slammed it against a car door. So he looked kind of pale and sweaty. Uh, he also had that five o'clock shadow problem. He also, the other thing with Nixon is that he was cocky. In 1952, he is almost booted off the Republican ticket because he um, has re received a, a couple of presents. His, his wife got a cloth coat or something like that. And so um, Eisenhower kind of lets Nixon dangle. And Nixon goes on TV and he gives this speech. It's become famous as the checker speech. Checker where he talks speech. about, right. yeah, my yeah, kids yeah. got this present. It was a dog. We're not giving that. My kids love that dog. They're not giving this speech. They're not giving the dog back. And that speech saved Nixon's career at a very vulnerable period. And as a result of that, Nixon has it in his head. I'm great on TV. I saved my career because of checkers. And you don't have to tell me about TV. I know what to do on TV. And he wasn't right. Look, TV had changed over time. TV is constantly changing. And Kennedy you know, outfoxed him on TV. Kennedy also put it out there that he wasn't doing debate prep, which was not true. He was doing his own debate prep. And Nixon said, well, I'm not going to, you know, I know the issue is I don't have to do debate prep. So he underprepared for the debate. He he didn't put enough makeup on. He wasn't rested enough. And, uh, and he just didn't look good. And in fact, uh, Harold McMillan, who was the uh, British prime minister at the time and was uh, friendly with Eisenhower, he called up Eisenhower and said, uh, your chap's beat, meaning uh, your mm. your candidate Nixon is, is losing because he looks like um, he looks like some kind of common criminal. So. Uh, so, yeah, there, there is there is something to the legend. I know you have a lot to say about debate prep, and I want to get to that next. But first, if I could just interject, I want to go back a little bit further in history, because, you know, we've talked about how this is the earliest debate, you know, way earlier than usual. Um, but we did have these famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, right? Um, 
tell us tell us just a bit about how the Lincoln Douglas debates are sort of different than the debates that we have now. I mean, obviously they weren't media events, right? It was like a barnstorming tour kind of thing, as I remember my American history. So talk a little bit about the impact that you think the Lincoln Douglas debates may have had and and whether that's a a good or a bad contrast with what we do today. Yeah, first thing to remember is that this was for a Senate race in Illinois and not a um, not a presidential race. Second thing that's important to remember is kind of we were talking about the smoke filled rooms. Uh, the Senate was not popularly elected then. Mm. So what Nixon, and, I'm sorry, what Lincoln and Douglas were appealing to were the state legislators who decide who wins and not the, the people necessarily, although obviously the people are important. They elect the state legislators. So it was a very different kind of race. Uh, they uh, they did go all around the state. They didn't have microphones and they spoke for these huge crowds. And uh, Lincoln, uh, you know, with relentless use of logic, kind of showed the absurdity of Douglas's position on slavery. Remember, Illinois is not a slave state, but um, but Douglas didn't want to get rid of slavery. And it, it just his, his argument didn't didn't stand up. And so Douglas wins the state legislature election to become senator, but he loses a lot of respect and um, and Lincoln uh, gains in the uh, reputation of the American people. And without the, those debates, he does not become president in 1860. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example of a debate that actually did end up having a very, very significant impact on American political history. Yeah, but not on the race that it was supposed right, to be. Exactly. Serving. Yeah. Just long term. Well, it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like Obama giving a speech at the Democratic convention and all of a sudden he shows up on the radar. Right. Which no one yeah, had ever heard of him before yeah. until he did that. But that was the thing that sort of clinched his nomination, I think, in the future. OK, let's talk about debate prep, because I've heard you I've heard you go on at, at very interesting length on this topic. It does seem that there's a pattern of incumbent presidents almost always doing a bad job with their first debate, whether it's because they're cocky or overconfident or just too busy or whatever. Uh, I, I would love for you to relate some of that history, including the Jack Kemp story. He's not a president, but he was a vice president. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to hear that and then we'll see how that relates to tonight, where there's a weird sense in which we have two incumbent presidents tonight, right? And it looks like it looks like there's a chance Trump may be taking it for granted, but on the other hand, Biden seems to have taken an entire week off to prepare for the for the debate. So how much how much does prep matter? Uh, what are some examples where people did a good job on prep, or what are some examples of when people did a bad job on prep? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things. First of all. Uh, it's not a crazy theory that incumbents do badly in the first debate. Think about Ford in 76. We already talked about him in the Soviet domination. Uh, Carter loses that first debate and only debate against Reagan in 1980, where Reagan pulls out the there you go again line. Uh, Reagan does poorly against Mondale in his first debate against Mondale when Reagan's the sitting president in 84. And he kind of has to rescue himself in the second debate where they change the way they do debate prep. I could talk about that later. And he also has the famous line about his age where he says, I'm not going to exploit for political reasons, the youth and inexperience of my opponent. Even Mondale laughed at that. And Mondale kind of knew he lost the election at that moment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> George H.W. Bush just loses all his debates against Bill Clinton, but Bill Clinton's kind of a unique political animal. And Bill Clinton is the is the exception to this rule because he doesn't do poorly in his debates against Bob Dole in 96. I mean, he's that guy was always ready to debate. I mean, that guy had the gift of gab and he did fine in all of his debates. Uh, but then it does happen again in 2004 where George W. Bush, and you, you mentioned that I'm a um, an analyst or um, a student of the debates. I'm also a practitioner in that I worked on the debate team for Bush and Cheney in 2004. And Bush does poorly in that first debate against John Kerry. Uh, I think he did better in the next two debates, but still, um, the, the theory holds. Obama, who also had the gift of gab, he does badly in his debate in 2012 against Mitt Romney, which may be the best debate performance of the 21st century. And then you have Trump does very poorly in his first debate in 2020 against Biden, in large part, I think, because he ignored the advice of his debate prep people who told him Biden makes mistakes if you let him talk. Just give him room to talk and he will he will mess up himself. And Trump just was unwilling to do that. He thought, I think, he thought that he could press Biden enough that Biden, because of his age, would melt down. And that just doesn't happen. 
on this. You can't get someone to kind of descend into a puddle of goo at this level. They're not going to do it. They're too well prepped. They're, they, they, you know, these guys are, even with Biden's age, these people are superior political athletes. Was, was, that the debate, was that the debate where Trump kept talking over Biden and, yeah, that was and the not, first giving, one. not even giving him a chance to screw up? Right. And Biden right. said, will you shut up, man, at one point? And then also I thought Trump was very nasty on the Hunter Biden thing. And I thought Biden had a good moment where he said, you know, my son, like many Americans, struggles with drugs. and I'm proud of my son and all that. So, um, you know, as someone who's not that sympathetic to Biden, I actually felt bad for Biden when he was being berated about his son. Look, I've got kids. I mean, you know, people have kids. You don't want to have your kid humiliated on the national stage. You know, Biden signed up for this. Biden is fair game in the debate. But his kid, it's, a, it's just a different animal. So um, what is it that leads uh, incumbents to do poorly in their first debate? Oh, is it much. is it just lack of time to prepare? Is it overconfidence? What is it? It is being mollycoddled for four years. Four years, nobody gets in your face. Nobody tells you you're wrong. You're in this total protective bubble. You're in the White House. And look, I've been there. I worked for the George W. Bush administration. Everyone's like, you're great, Mr. President. You're so brilliant, Mr. President. It's fantastic, Mr. President. Nobody is getting up there in your grill and really going after you. And theoretically, these guys aren't stupid. They know that the debate opponent's going to come after them, but they just aren't used to it. It's like, it's, you know, it's like uh, exercising a muscle. No. Um, and if, you know, I, I play a lot of tennis, as you know, if I played tennis against patsies all the time, you, know, you, you just wouldn't get better. You just say, oh, they're going to, you know, they're going to hit these soft shots, but you, know, you got to play against people who are tough. And Presidents don't play against the tough opponents for those four years. And we constantly hear this thing about, you know, Biden hasn't done a real um, interview uh, with a journalist in, in months. Uh, Trump often didn't want to do um, interviews with disfavored um, journalists. Uh, Obama, too. He also kept himself away from that. And journalists, he, journalists themselves don't even replicate the experience of being up there against somebody who wants to destroy you, who is like you, has been elected to stuff. And uh, and knows your tendencies, has been following you, has been uh, watch tape on you, and they come after you hard. And it's not easy. And if you are just kind of in this bubble of, yes, Mr. President, you're great, Mr. President, you're not going to be ready. And that's what has happened to most of them. Um, so I want to I want to get your sort of firsthand description about what debate prep was like since you were involved in that. But I want to go back and uh Along this along this theme of preparation, um, you have you have a great story about Jack Kemp, who of course was one of my heroes. You know, if you're if you're like a policy nerd like me, uh, you want like a philosopher king to be elected president, right? Unfortunately, those are never the kind of people that <laughs> that we ever that we ever nominate or that we ever elect. Uh, but your your story about Jack Kemp's failure to prepare for his vice presidential debate, I think is is very memorable to me. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, look, Tom, like you, I was very excited when Jack Kemp was the nominee in 96. I, I was interested in the vice presidential nominee. I was interested in supporting him in 88. Um, I loved his uh, engagement with ideas, his uh, supply side uh, tax cuts. I mean, I, I was a big fan of Jack Kemp and he, he kind of, he palled around with the intellectual uh, side of the, the conservative movement, which you, well, you know, to, to, to me, to me, to me, Jack Kemp was, you know, I mean, Paul Ryan and Jack Kemp are basically this, almost the same profile of, of, you know, elected official, which is they really do care about ideas and they really do spend a lot of serious time thinking about policy, you know, but then when implementation time comes along, they're maybe not so good at that, but yeah. And, and, was, and they both I, lost vice presidential debates. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's interesting. And I wouldn't have expected that of either of them. So look, Jack Kemp, uh, he had this attitude of, I don't need to prepare for an idiot like Al Gore, which was just wrong. And uh, the stories were that he wanted to watch Monday Night Football instead of doing his debate prep. And he just he just coasted into that debate. And Al Gore was actually was a terrific debater. The Atlantic wrote this piece about how he was the best debater of the late, late 20th century. I don't know if that's true, but but he was relentless and he did his homework and he was good. And he really went hard after Kemp and Kemp couldn't defend the conservative policies, which, you know, it was hurting me in my heart. I mean, I, I was painful to watch. I wanted him to do better. And then the great story here is that um, Tom Downey played Jack Kemp against Gore in the debate prep. And Andrew Cuomo, former governor of New York, who left a disgrace, but he was also the debate prep team. And he was watching the debate between the actual debate between Gore and Kemp. 
and he saw how badly Kemp was doing. And he started shouting to the TV, just jokingly, uh, put Downey in there. This guy can't hack it. Meaning Downey <laughs> as, as Kemp would do better than Kemp himself did. Well, you know, the knock on Al Gore was that he was wooden, not that he was not smart. You know, uh, he was he, he was he could be wooden, but yeah. in a debate setting, I mean, he was feral. And in fact, there's another great story in 2000. George W. Bush, for whom I worked, uh, is prepping to debate Gore. And Rob Portman, who later became a senator from Ohio and was USTR and head of uh, Office of Management Budget, he was a great debate prepper, by the way. I, I worked with him on the uh, Cheney debates in 04. I could talk about that later. But Portman is playing Gore. And Portman takes this seriously. I mean, he listens to recording, he watches video, he puts on the accent. I mean, he portrays Gore. And at one point, he goes right up in Bush's face, right up, hovering over him. And Bush leans forward and kisses Portman on the head. And he says, he's not going to do that. And Portman said, he is. I've watched him. He does that. And so on the debate stage, I think it was the second debate, Gore did exactly that. He stalked George W. Bush. He walked right up to him while Bush was talking and hovered over him. And Gore's a big guy, I mean, hefty guy, tall guy. And Bush, having prepared for it with Portman, he was totally cool about it, didn't lose his, didn't, didn't get flustered at all. And he kind of head checked Gore, not physically. He just looked at him and he goes, yeah. And he kind of like acknowledged his presence and moved on. And it was wow. a great moment and it totally deflated Gore. Wow. And, and you know, that's a great example of that debate prep prepared him for that, which he otherwise would not have been prepared for and, and would not have anticipated it. Yeah, I got to tell a flip side story of that. Um, and I heard this from uh, Rob Lowe, the Hollywood actor. Um, he's got a, a really good podcast and he was telling a story about Rob Reiner, the, um, you know, the, the former actor and later director, very big, big liberal. And apparently he helped advise Gore in 2000. And he told Gore to get right up in Bush's face, which in retrospect was pretty bad advice. So, um, you know, Hollywood guys, and there's a whole history of Hollywood people advising Democratic political candidates. You know, they've got advice, but it's not always good advice. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, let's talk about that, because uh, you you revealed that you were involved in debate prep. So what is that like? And I mean, I mean. How many like how many sessions did you do? Are there like three practice sessions before the Great real question. debate or two or how does that work so i'm working on bush cheney 04 which means i'm helping both candidates i'm doing the debate prep books for both candidates cheney has about 10 full dress rehearsals where he is, stands up as cheney and portman stands up as john edwards and they go at each other and i'll tell you tom in the first one portman kicked his butt but as time went on, Cheney got better and better. And by the end, he was holding his own against Portman and did great in that debate against Edwards. Now, Bush, and this gets back to the point where presidents uh, don't like to have people in their face when they're, they're president. Bush barely wanted to do full dress debates. He didn't want to have a lot of people in the room. He didn't want to uh, do it too often. He thought he knew his stuff. And he did three kind of haphazard uh, prep sessions and they weren't really full dress where the other person's playing uh, playing the opponent carry uh, and he just wasn't as ready i mean cheney prepared more and did better as a result now i will say when bush did poorly in that first debate they kind of hunkered down and took debate prep a little more seriously after that but you really have to do the work if you're going to be ready for these things well you know cheney had been a ceo with with halliburton right before yep. before he was vp and so he probably had to undergo all sorts of media training for shareholder meetings and things like that. So, you know, he may have been a little more accustomed to being coached on things like that than George W. was. So, Cheney so was enjoy, very enjoy. good, especially after he did after the practice sessions. And I remember sitting there, you know, I was the guy who wrote the book. So I knew all the facts and figures. And at one point uh, they were looking for, you know, what the education attainment number was or something like that. And I just shouted it out. And Cheney said to me after, how do you know all those numbers so well? And I said to him, uh, well, when I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards and I'd read the stats on the back of the, the baseball cards and I'd memorize the, the statistics. And Chandy's like, I used to do that too. I was a big Cincinnati Reds fan. That was a great moment. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when George W. was doing his debate prep, who stood in uh, for his opponent? Are they names we know? Uh, no, because he didn't really do it the same way. So. Okay. Okay. All right. But but Cheney had Edward. Uh, Cheney had uh, Portman doing Edwards, and he really did a 
He, I mean, he would, this is before iPads and he listened on a Walkman and he would just listen to these CDs of Edwards talking. And I swear to you, Tom, he didn't put on the accent, but the cadences and the stories, he sounded just like Edwards, except wow. without a Southern accent. Wow. Well, you know, Edwards um, was an extremely attractive candidate until he kind of melted down, you know, but I mean, you, yeah. he's the, he's the kind of person who you certainly felt like you needed to prepare against. Did you ever see that uh, famous, uh, was one of the early viral videos of uh, Edwards fixing his hair and they uh, att they attached a, I feel pretty to it? Yeah, yeah. Well, there uh, was there was there was a whole thing with Edwards where he like traveled with a hairstylist yeah. or something, right? I remember, <laughs> I remember hearing the story about uh, Joe Lieberman just seeing that video and laughing his head off. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> that's great. That's great. Um, so let me ask you a sort of um, bigger picture. And we've alluded to a little bit of this, but how much difference do debates make? Um, I'm a heavy podcast listener. Every podcast I've listened to for the last three or four days has, you know, the podcast people have been opining about this. And, and you'll hear people who say debates are a waste of time. They don't really ever change anybody's mind. You'll have people saying, you know, even if that's true, we deserve to hear from them. And then you'll have people saying, no, debates have a tremendous potential to change somebody's mind. So, you know, I, I think with, with, with Trump and Biden, it seems like people have so formed their views of these two that it is kind of an open question to what degree can a debate influence, you know, are there any undecideds left, you know? I mean, in, in general, should our attitude be that debates actually are really, really important and they really can change things? Or should we think of debates more just like political theater? There's a little bit to both in my answer to your question, but let me just say, I'm going to give three examples where debates really mattered. 1960, we talked about uh, Nixon versus Kennedy, and Kennedy just looked better on TV. 1976, Ford makes that big gaffe about uh, Soviet domination, and uh, he's behind Carter, but he's catching up, and he's catching up by about, about the rate of a point of day. And Jim Baker, who was the campaign manager, said, if he hadn't made that gaffe, we probably would have passed Carter. Maybe yes, maybe no, but but I, I think that gaffe yep. hurt him. And then Reagan in 1980, people are a little uncertain. This Reagan guy is an actor. We don't know if he's serious. And he stood his own against Jimmy Carter, who was wonkier than he was in that great moment where he said, uh, there you go again. I mean, he, re he really showed leadership. So those are three moments where debates mattered. But let's talk about some other moments where they didn't matter. 2012, Romney does the best debate performance in recent years against Obama, still loses, right? Um, in 2016, uh, I think Hillary beats Trump in that first debate, but Hillary still loses. So uh, it's not dispositive. Sometimes it's just political theater, but they can make a difference. And what I like to say is that 98% of what these guys say in the debates is forgotten, never remembered again. But that 2% can you know, really make a difference. It is interesting because as I think back on uh, debate history, you're exactly right. Like there are just brief moments that you remember, you know, like I, I, I briefly remember the Candy Crowley incident, right? Uh, where Obama says, read him the quote, Candy, read him the quote. And 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 Romney utterly failed to, to jump on that, right? And to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are, is your campaign supplying information to the right, moderators? Did you guys coordinate? Yeah, that was right. Funny. You know, that are was... you coordinating? And he's just, I don't know if he's too nice of a guy or whatever, but he just lets it go. I mean, I think there were two or three instances where Romney failed to pounce, as we say these days, right? Uh, where he just, you know, he had the facts. He was right about Russia policy and all these sorts of things, right? But he just like, he failed to pounce. He failed to defend himself. He failed to do it. And if you think about it, those do seem to be the moments that matter is when one candidate or the other pounces, you know, or attacks, um, you know, it's not a general election debate, but of course, I, I'll never get over the experience of sitting in the basement of the Capitol Hill Club watching the Republican primary where Rick Perry couldn't remember, you know, the three, yeah, the, the, the three cabinet agencies that he would eliminate. And uh, I was a, I was, I, I was, I am a huge Rick Perry fan. And I thought Rick Perry was, was very competitive to that moment, right? Yeah. So it's, it's going it to be the first line in his obituary. It, well, yeah. I mean, it, it goes back to the Not point you away. were making about like, if you're an incumbent with a strong lead, why debate? Because you can only hurt yourself. I mean, debate, debates are 
I would guess three quarters of the time an opportunity to screw up and maybe one quarter of the time, you know, an opportunity to actually score points. But but in, in your in your recalling and your recollections of some of these historical debates, you've given examples of both, right, where people have, you know, the debate has made the difference for someone positively or it has made the difference for them negatively. Yeah. And let me talk a little bit about the Romney incident, which I think is interesting. So I was at the debates with uh, Romney. I was on the Romney team in 2012. And uh, in that first debate, I mean, that was just a great moment. Romney destroyed Obama, really one of the b biggest beatdowns I, I can remember. Uh, but it was also the same week that the 47 percent comment came out, right. which was where, where Romney said, said that 47 percent of Americans are basically takers and they're going to vote against me no matter what. I'm trying to win the uh, other 53 um, percent. And, you know, it was just it was just not a smart comment. It was um, uh, it was overheard in a fundraiser. And then it just comes out the, at the wrong time for Romney. But then the second debate is with the Candy Crowley problem and he's not aggressive enough. And then the third debate is the foreign policy debate. And I was in there when the um, when when Romney's uh, top advisors came into the room, I was one of the surrogates. So I was going to go out into the green room and talk about uh, how Romney did. So before the debate, they said, we have told Romney to be presidential, to coast, to not get in a knife fight with Obama. This is the foreign policy debate. You want to show that you can deal with world leaders uh, in an ele elevated way. Don't really get into the mud and, and fight. And um, after the debate, those same advisors, and you, you know their names, but I'm not going to say them here. They came out and they said this was terrific and we have nothing we want to walk back. He didn't make any mistakes. He made no gaffes. And we think this is a win. Well, it wasn't a win. Obama beat the heck out of Romney. Romney looked kind of weak uh, and a bit of a patsy. And he just took it from Obama, including on that line where uh, Romney was critical of Russia. And, Ro and Obama says the 80s called they want their foreign policy back. Right. Well, Romney right. was right. Russia is no. our biggest geopolitical foe. Ro Russia is a problem. And no. he just took it from Obama for an hour and a half. And it was a mistake. And those two advisors said, oh, well, you know, we, we did the right thing because we were, you know, we, we hung back and we didn't show ourselves to be too nasty. Uh, but, you know, this is this is a fight for survival. Yeah. And you can't really coast in these situations. Yeah, I, I just remember thinking Romney is just too nice to succeed in this in this um, in this arena. Uh, and, and you know what? It wasn't too nice in the first debate. Well, no, that's true. But I mean, what what do you end up? What does the average person end up remembering from that? They they remember the forty seven percent. They remember Which the wasn't binders. in a debate, <laughs> right? They remember binders full of women, and they remind they they remember uh, the, the dog on the roof of the car. The dog, right? That's okay. that's what people remember. That's what they take away from that. Which is, I guess, more of a comment on our shallow politics than anything else. But. So let's talk about um, tonight's debate a little bit, um, because this is different, and it's different in a lot of ways. It's different because it's early. It's different because we do have this weird sort of two incumbents kind of thing. And it's also weird because of the rules, and I'm particularly intrigued by the rules. I have always believed that having an audience for a debate was a mistake, I'll be interested in seeing what you think about that. But I've always thought having an audience for a debate was a mistake. On the other hand, it, it, it's conceivable to me that that makes a difference because I think Trump feeds off the energy of an audience. And, and I'm a little bit intrigued to see what happens when Trump is in a room with no audience. Uh, and I'm And I'm intrigued to see what happens when the moderators do actually turn somebody's mic off, I mean, it doesn't stop the, the two from yelling at eat each other, it just stops us from hearing it, right? So what are your thoughts on sort of the format for tonight and sort of the weird situation? Yeah, I think the reason that we have the rules, we have the rules that we have the rules that we have is because the Trump campaign was saying, we'll debate anywhere, anytime. They wanted to get Biden out there because they still have this theory that he's going to, because of his age, melt down on stage. And so the Biden people came out and said, OK, well, uh, you know, here's what we want. And the Trump people said yes to everything. Um, yeah. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, uh, the the Gaza situation a little bit, right? Where um, the U.S. is telling Israel, you've got to make a deal no matter what. So Hamas keeps uh, making more and more ridiculous demands. And Israel says yes. And then Hamas says, no, we have more demands. Right. So if you're desperate to make a deal, you're not going to make the best deal for you. And so that's why we have the rules we have. So yeah, so so the Trump the Trump campaign basically just accepted all of Biden's conditions, I guess, under the assumption that he just can't hold up for 90 minutes, 
right? Yeah, it's, it's a win it's, for us to get Biden on stage. Okay. All right. Now, I don't, I think you know me well enough to know that I'm not a conspiracy theory kind of a person. Um, but we do know, we do know in past American history that presidents have hidden health problems from the American people. We know that uh, that Jack Kennedy was um, under the influence of medication and stimulants and pain pills and things like that. We know that to go back to Rick Perry, Rick Perry blamed his his brain fog on being under the effects of pain medication. Uh, there's a lot of people out there saying the only way Biden makes it 90 minutes if somehow he's on Adderall or some sort of a stimulant or something like that. Is that is that crazy or do we have examples in, in American political history, those sorts of things? Look, I don't think it's crazy. I think Biden is on some kind of stimulant. That doesn't mean it's an illegal stimulant or an improper stimulant. Maybe, maybe it's Red Bull. I mean, but whatever it is that works for him, he's going to take before the debate. And I think that's totally legit. Uh, and it's clear to me, if you look at some of his previous performances, State of the Union or that press conference when they were asking about him being old and infirm, I mean, right. he seemed more on top of his game in those circumstances than he does in his usual kind of befuddled uh, muddling around. So, uh, yeah, I think he does do something to prep himself for these big moments. And, you know, he's an 80 something year old guy. He should do that. Um, and, and again, I, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, yeah. you know, maybe they should disclose it. But yeah, you're right. Uh, Kennedy did take uh, all sorts of uh, drugs and you know, he didn't talk about his Addison's disease. Uh, you know, there are hidden health problems and you know, sometimes people, people, you know, have the uh, right to keep some of their health stuff private. But yeah, but I, I do think uh, Biden probably takes something that works for him before the debate. Trump maybe takes something too. I mean, maybe, you know, he drinks more Diet Coke before. I don't know. Well, you know, the, the State of the Union, I think, is a good example because there was a lot of chatter about Biden's senior moments. And then the state, you know, so expectations get set so low. And then Biden gets up and actually does a decent performance at the State of the Union. It's kind of like, OK, well, you know, the Republicans are just blowing smoke. So I, 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 and it does seem like in the last few days, the Trump campaign has been trying to lower expectations, you know, because I think they realize that there's a, if you're, if your strategy is simply get him in front of a TV ca camera for 90 minutes and watch him fall apart. We haven't seen evidence that he's going to do that. He does seem to be able to rise to the occasion when necessary, whether that's, you know, uh, aided by extra rest or extra, you know, caffeine or whatever. He does seem to be able to do that. Yeah. And, and I think he probably will. I don't think he's going to melt down tonight. Uh, I think Trump's got to show that uh, he's on top of stuff, that he's not too nasty because people don't want that. Um, and that he does let Biden talk. Biden will make mistakes. I mean, again, he's not going to fall into a puddle of goo. That's not going to happen. But he will say dumb things. He'll make mistakes. He might lose a, a word once in a while, uh, which he does. So, uh, I think Trump has to let him talk. And and in, in a perverse way, the debate rules that the Biden people wanted could help Trump because Trump can't interrupt. He's got to let Biden talk, given the rules as they are. Yeah. I want to remind our, our audience that we are taking questions. You can go down to that bottom menu on your Zoom screen, and there's an option that says raise hand. If you don't see it, just enlarge your Zoom window and you'll see it. We have a couple questions, but this will be a great time for you to raise your hand if you want to ask a question or make a comment for Tevi to respond to. Um, Tevi, who do you think has the most to lose tonight, or is that even a logical question? It's a very logical question. I, I think that Trump has the edge in the debate tonight. So in, in that, he has, he has the edge in the polls right now. So in some ways, he has the most to lose. But Biden's the incumbent president. So by definition, he has the most to lose because he can lose the most powerful position in the land. Um, I, I'm going to sort of throw this out there. There was this theory that that Biden, that, you know, Democrat insiders, you know, manipulated Biden into an early debate almost as an audition to see whether he could hold up to the rigors of the campaign and to do it in, ahead of the convention would give them an opportunity to come up with a plan B. Do you believe that at all? I don't. Look, the Biden people control the nomination process. They control the party. I'm not saying that in a nefarious way. That's just the way it works. And the Biden people aren't sitting around saying, oh, our guy is old and befuddled. They're saying, Mr. President, you're on top of your game. I mean, it's part of the problem with incumbent presidents in their first debates. And all those people who are around Biden, they have their power. They have their big fancy jobs because of Biden being in office. And they lose that if somebody else comes in. You, know, th you think Gavin Newsom is going to keep all the people at the top echelons of the Biden administration? Heck no. So they have no incentive to do that. 
They control the process, and I just don't see that happening. Okay, fair enough. Um, it would be interesting if it did. To uh, to quote Matthew McConaughey, be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> it, yeah, it, act- if it happened, look, if they put up pretty much any person up against Trump, I think that person would probably win. And unless it's Harris. Um, but on the other side, if the um, uh, if the Republicans were up against anyone, if, if the Democrats were up against anybody to Trump or Biden was up against anybody to Trump, I think uh, the Republicans would win easily. So yeah. uh, you've got two unpopular people running against each other and both parties would benefit from putting someone else in there, but they just can't structurally do it. It kind of goes back to the conversation that, well, the quick side, the aside that we did about primaries, right? A, a lot of if, if you've only been paying attention to American politics for the past 18 years or so, you've never seen a real political convention. You know what I mean? Sure. You, you, you've never seen a convention. I, I guess the last one really was, was it 1980 when Reagan and Ford were basically making deals to see who the nominee would be or or all of that? Or that would have been in 1976, I guess. Right. Um but I don't know that we've really seen a, a political convention where the outcome was even in question since then, have we? Well, the last one where it's at all close is the um, 1980 Carter um, Kennedy race, where Carter pretty much has has so, sewed it up beforehand, but not completely. And he's still making concessions to Kennedy uh, going in. And then they have that moment on the stage where they want to raise hands together. And, and <laughs> Kennedy refuses to raise hands with Carter. And it looks kind of bad. So that, that was the closest we've had recently to a, a contested situation at a convention. Well, as a as a politics nerd, there's there's nothing I'd rather see happen this summer than a real convention that actually <laughs> had the potential to come up with a different nominee but uh I well, watch the chicago convention i think that's going to be yeah. super interesting there's going to be yeah. a lot of leftist radicals who are going to try and disrupt things try and make it like uh, chicago 1968 again mm-hmm. and uh you know i expect some ugliness i also think there's a uh, this is a whole nother topic of mine is on party platforms. I think the Republicans have a huge opportunity to contrast themselves with the radicalism of what the Democratic par- platform is likely going to be because yeah. they're going to give in to those leftist impulses. And the Republicans just have to do a normal platform. Yeah. And it will be a very stark and positive contrast. Well, you know, I think it was the last Democratic convention where somebody mentioned God from the stage and the delegates booed, they booed God. Yeah, they booed God. You know, <laughs> Which is kind of crazy, but then on that's the other where the hand, Democratic Party is right now, right? No, ex- exactly. It's I mean, God booing I mean, party. As a conservative Republican, it seems to me that all we have to do is not be insane, right? Because the other side is so crazy. But on the other hand, we couldn't come up with a platform at the last Republican convention either, or was that two conventions ago? That no, we that didn't was last have convention. That was intentional, by the way. I mean, the, no. the Trump folks wanted to have this kind of postcard platform, which I think is a mistake. Because uh, yeah. it doesn't get people out there excited to vote for something. And also it makes it about what the candidate's whims are as opposed to what the policy prescriptions are. Oh, I, I definitely believed that 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 the idea was that Trump and his people did not want to be boxed into any positions. I, I definitely think that that was a reason they didn't want to they didn't want a platform because it really is Trumpism is whatever Trump wants to do at the moment. OK, um, do you have anything else that you think uh, we should have talked about before we go to questions? What, I'm what, eager what, to hear your people's questions. So uh, okay, let's, let's, let's do that. It. Let's do that. Let's do that. OK, um, we've kind of uh, Laura, Laura Huni, um, we've already kind of covered this. What do you think the chances are that either party nominates someone besides Trump and Biden? Less than five percent. I think it's low. OK, I guess so, if anything, the we're people going... who are in charge of the process are the ones who could make that happen. And they, they have every incentive to stay in power. Yeah. I mean, unless some shocking exogenous thing happened, right? Yeah. Like like one of them dying or getting very attack, sick right? or, or having a real physical yep. problem that can no longer be brushed aside. OK, um, uh, Diane Edmondson, uh, who do you expect to be the VP candidates for each party? I, I, I assume we know who Biden's VP candidate is. He, he, there's no way he could he could ditch his vice presidential candidate. Do you care about the VP stakes? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Oh heck yeah! I really want to see who he picks for VP, and I hope it's from the uh, kind of uh, the, the sort of more Reaganite wing of the Republican Party. 
And uh, I want somebody with real foreign policy chops because we are in a dangerous world in a much more dangerous world than we were in four years ago. Yeah. And I want to see someone like a Mike Pompeo or a Tom Cotton, somebody who really understands the world situation um, of the candidates they've been talking about are Rubio, Vance and Burgum. I don't love Rubio because of the constitutional problem. You can't have two people from the same state for um, Trump and Rubio, both from Florida. Uh, so I, I like Burgum. I, I thought he did a good job on the on the debate stage. Um, and he's got a good manner about him. So uh, I would of the, if those are the three, I'd prefer Burgum. But I'd also I'd like to see a female vice presidential candidate. And I'll tell you why. Not because I you know have uh, you know some, suddenly some DEI convert, but in that debate between Pence and Harris, I thought Pence did great. I thought he really did. Uh, he took her to school. Um, and the kind of narrative on Twitter was, oh, my gosh, he's mansplaining. How dare he mansplain? He wasn't mansplaining. He was debating. Right. Yeah. If you're in a situation where you can't push back against some thing your opponent says because they're female and you're male, then we're kind of in a topsy turvy, crazy world. And so I think that if there were a female candidate like a uh, Elise Stefanik, who I think acquitted herself very well in those hearings against the insufferable, arrogant Ivy League presidents. I think uh, she could take Harris to school like Pence did, and nobody would accuse her of mansplaining. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, just just, you know, just as a Republican, I would like to see a woman on the ticket. Um, and again, I mean, we we focus so much on Biden's age, but Trump is not Trump is not a young pup. And you you do have to think you I mean, there, what's yep. the purpose of the VP position? Absolutely. You know, I mean, you do have to think about I that. want a reassuring person on the ticket. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, hmm, do you think Republicans want Biden to do well enough to keep the nomination because they'd rather face him in the election rather than another candidate? That 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 I th I think this question it's it, thank you for the question. It's a great question, but it's sort of the too clever by half category. I think. I mean, what do you what's your reaction to that question? I don't think Biden is going off the ticket. So uh, <laughs> I think Republicans are better off if Biden has a bad performance. And uh, and Trump beats him and people say, look, you know, this guy can't hack it. And it's uh, time for somebody new. Yeah. Um, I've got another question here. This is a whole other, other topic. If not primaries, how do you suggest we choose a candidate for each party? Um, I, I think it's important to remember that, as you said, the Constitution does not specify primaries. I mean, parties could choose any number of ways to choose a candidate. You could just you could just do it. You could literally choose a nominee through having a legitimate state convention, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you could do it that way. It has to be assigned, according to the party rules, by delegates, right? The delegates from each state decide. But those delegates don't have to be decided by a primary or a caucus. Lord knows what the heck an Iowa caucus is. I mean, that's not, it doesn't seem to me like a small D democratic process. So yeah. the parties can choose however they want to create their state delegations and then vote at the convention. But it, again, it doesn't have to be through the primary process, which as we've seen, it's kind of messy. And you know, somebody, you know, with, with the exception of Bernie Sanders in, in 2000, if somebody sweeps a couple of early primaries, it's pretty much over right at the beginning. This is an example, I think, of 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 people who, um, and I don't mean this as a knock, but people who really don't know anything about a little bit older American political history, that the Constitution gives wide purview to the states to choose all kinds of ways of doing things, right? And and this this became an issue for me during the whole debate over January 6th and all that. The states can choose their electors for their electoral college in any number of ways, but once they do it, it's done. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether it reflects a popular vote of the state. It really doesn't matter. I, rem I remember explaining to people, if Pennsylvania wants to have a corrupt process, that's up to Pennsylvania voters. That's that's their right if that's what they want to do. But once the state certifies the electors, it's done. And not everything, not everything is run through Washington. Not all the rules are delegated in Washington and not all the rules are delegated in the Constitution. So. I think we have a failure to think outside the box these days on a lot of these political things. You know, you could look, a state could just decide we're not going to have a, we're not going to have a primary election. That's just not how we're going to do it. We're going to save a bunch of money uh, and we're just going to let the party choose and restore some power to the parties. I mean, I'm very much on board with Jonah Goldberg's take that, I mean, the problem we have is that our pot parties are too weak, not that they're too strong. I agree. I'm, I'm good friends with Jonah and I'm totally with him on that, uh, as on most things. <laughs> Okay. Um, 
let's see one more question if i can pull it up here okay um what happens if someone falls flat on their face tonight during the, during, during the debate um i guess you'd say we don't expect that to happen but if so the parties are prepared to deal with it right look you know the um number one rule when you're public speaking is just keep going. So let's say you mess up. Let's say you have a Perry oops moment. You just keep going. You can't yeah. just say, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. I'm getting off the stage now. That doesn't happen. You just keep going and you hope that that moment is not the 2% of what's remembered. We talked about how 98% yeah. is not remembered, 2% gets remembered. So yeah. you just keep going. You I don't think anybody's going to have such a bad performance that you know they take them off the stage and shoot them afterwards. It just doesn't happen that way. Okay. Are you going to be uh, commenting anywhere tonight after the debate on Twitter or anything? Uh, I am going to be interviewed by Reuters right afterwards. Okay. And I'm going to be on CNN tomorrow night to talk about my thoughts on the debate. Very good. And uh, tell us again the name of your upcoming book. The Power and the Money, Epic Clashes Between Commanders-in-Chief and Titans of Industry. Very good. Well, I will be pre-ordering a copy this evening before the thank debate, you. and I hope a lot of our a lot of our friends out there will as well. Tevi, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I love nerding out with you on this stuff. It's it's great stuff. Thank you for being a friend to IPI. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. This is great fun, and thanks for all the good stuff that IPI does. And for all of our attendees, I hope you enjoyed it half as much as I did. And again, this will be archived on our website and it will be ar archived on our YouTube channel. You could just go to YouTube and search for Institute for Policy Innovation and um, you'll be able to share this with your friends. And uh, I will also be probably live tweeting a little bit tonight from the uh, debate. My Twitter handle is uh, T-G-I-O-V-A-N-E-T-T-I. -T -T -I. It's always kind of fun to comment in real time on things as it's happening. Uh, so... Can I do Let's, one quick shout out before we yes, close? Yes, absolutely. I just want to give a quick shout out to Addie. I bet she, she loved this also. Oh, yeah. Addie, Addie, is, uh, Addie is very much a political animal. She loves this stuff and she loves you, as do I. So Big fan thanks, of myself. thanks so much, Tevi. And thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon. And uh, I wish you an eventful debate this evening. Bye-bye.